It is a platitude to say that the duty of politicians is to respond to the wishes and opinions of those who elected them. But it is precisely this platitude that has made it difficult to think clearly in the matter. Thanks to the internet, the iPhone and all the other gadgets that permit instant messages and crowd emotions, we have entered a new situation in which people can make their opinions and wishes directly known to whoever is interested and directly influential on the legislature without passing through the political process. It is not only the great question of Europe that is being decided now by a referendum. Politicians are besieged at all hours of the day and night by their constituents, demanding an instant vote on whatever issue has briefly grabbed their attention. Is this an advance for democracy? And if it is, does it enhance or detract from the accountability of our legislators? The Greek city-state was small enough and its citizens well enough known to each other that major legislative and political decisions could be taken by an assembly of all the citizens. That kind of direct democracy was never followed in the Roman Empire, which, when it sought to make people accountable for their decisions, did so through representative institutions. For how could an empire be governed by direct democracy? From the Middle Ages onwards, we have been governed by parliaments in which the various important interests in the state have been represented before the sovereign, whose decisions depended on their consent. Rousseau famously objected to representative government as a denial of the free choice of the people, whose general will emerges only if all of them participate in the important decisions. But he had no clear idea how to govern a large modern society by direct appeal to the people. Now, with everyone armed with a smartphone, it might be said that Rousseau's ideal is within our reach. In his famous speech to the electors of Bristol, Edmund Burke distinguished between a representative, which is what he hoped to be, and a delegate. A delegate is someone chosen by a group of people to relay their opinion or their decision. The responsibility of the delegate begins and ends with the announcement of a decision already made by others. In other words, delegates make no decision of their own, and therefore no decision for which they are accountable. If politicians were delegates, they would never be in the position to say, be it on my own head what I now decide. They would be the mere instruments for decisions and opinions that they cannot change, and which they might even disown. A representative, Burke argued, is not like that at all. He is not elected to relay the opinions of his constituents. He is elected to represent their interests. He must make decisions according to his own conscience, regardless of whether his constituents happen to agree with him. That is what it means to take responsibility. Burke put the matter in a much-quoted passage that deserves to be quoted again. It ought to be the happiness and glory of a representative to live in the strictest union, the closest correspondence and the most unreserved communication with his constituents. Their wishes ought to have great weight with him, their opinion high respect, their business unremitted attention. It is his duty to sacrifice his repose, his pleasures, his satisfactions to theirs, and above all, ever and in all cases, to prefer their interest to his own. But his unbiased opinion, his mature judgment, his enlightened conscience, he ought not to sacrifice to you, to any man, or to any set of men living. These he does not derive from your pleasure, no, nor from the law and the constitution. They are a trust from providence, for the abuse of which he is deeply answerable. Your representative owes you not his industry only, but his judgment, and he betrays instead of serving you if he sacrifices it to your opinion. A representative is accountable to his electorate. They can punish him by ejecting him from office. For representative government to work, however, representatives must be free to ignore the petitions of those who elected them, to consider each matter on its merits, and to address the interests of those who did not vote for them just as much as the interests of those who did. The important point is that representation, unlike delegation, is an office, defined by its responsibilities. 
to refer every matter to the constituents and to act on majority opinion case by case is precisely to avoid those responsibilities, to retreat behind the consensus and to cease to be genuinely accountable for what one does. Almost every day there pops up on my screen a petition from change.org or avaz.org urging me to experience the one-click passport to moral virtue. It is not that the causes are always wrong. It is rather that I am being asked to add my vote in the absence of any institution that will hold me or anyone else to account for it. Nobody is raising the question of what other interests need to be considered besides the one mentioned in the petition. Nobody in this process, neither the one who proposes the petition nor the many who sign it, has the responsibility of getting things right or runs the risk of being ejected from office if he fails to do so. All we have is the mass expression of opinion without responsibility or risk. Not a single person who signs the petition, including those who compose it, will bear the cost of it, for the cost is transferred to everyone on behalf of whatever single-issue pressure group takes the benefit. The common good, rather than mass sentiment, should be the source of law, and the common good may be hard to discover and easily obscured by crowd emotions. It is for this reason that we elect people to be our representatives, so that they will not decide issues of public concern by a one-click response, but by taking full responsibility for their decisions and proposing themselves for re-election on the strength of them. Representatives do not sit on the benches of Parliament in order to jump up at every opportunity and repeat what the voters told them to say. They might very well decide that the voters were ill-informed or moved by some passion that should, in their own interests, be overruled or discounted. The amendments to the United States Constitution were designed to ensure that it would be the common good, rather than the temporary enthusiasms of the majority or the interests of determined factions, that would be consulted when laws were made. We can all see the point of this just as soon as we imagine mass campaigns being mounted for causes that are repugnant to us. Do we think that our representatives should be influenced by a Twitter storm advocating the expulsion of the Jews? Do we think that issues like the death penalty or the treatment of refugees should be decided by a mass vote of internet addicts? We vote people into office because we feel confident in entrusting them with decisions that we have neither the expertise nor the capacity to make for ourselves, but which are nevertheless fundamental to our collective well-being. Of course, it would be a foolish member of Parliament who decided to ignore public opinion. But public opinion in a democracy is not a matter of saying yes or no to some simplified question posed on a website. It is the result of a collective discussion with many constituent parts. It emerges from the broad currents of argument and reflection among people who are ready to defer to the facts and to acknowledge the right of others to disagree with them. It is precisely through such institutions as Parliament that public opinion finds its voice, and to think that petitions on the internet are a reliable guide to what the people think is to make a profound mistake about human nature. We are not creatures of the moment. We do not necessarily know what our own interests are, but depend upon advice and discussion. Hence we need processes that impede us from making impetuous choices and which bring us face to face with our real interests. It is precisely this that is being obscured by the referendum culture. Decisions are being made at the point of least responsibility by men and women in the street with their iPhones, asked suddenly to click yes or no in response to an issue that they have never thought about before and may never think about again and the person or group asking for their decision is just as unaccountable for it as they are. How do we persuade people to acknowledge that responsible decision-making is not the same thing as a one-click response? Should we organise a petition on change.org asking people to sign up to a law banning petitions? Or should we rely on our legislators to be courageous in the face of their constituents and to tell them, when necessary, that it is not their opinions that matter, but the common good?